السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم، الحمد لله رب العالمين. والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. أما بعد. How's everyone doing? Good. Everyone excited? Yeah. That's good. Uh, okay. Basically, like I told you yesterday, Today we want to look at ways of convincing, ways of explaining concepts. So, uh, I want to tell you exactly what we want to do. A lot of times people like Dawa workshops to be where you give them a lot of information on how to, uh, on what to say, okay? Uh, mostly, I don't like to teach like that. I don't like to teach you what to say in every scenario. I like to give you the tools with which you can formulate your own refutation in any scenario. Because I can't, I can't tell you of every single scenario you'll encounter for the rest of your life. But what I can do is give you the tools by which you can fix and formulate your own responses to different scenarios, to new belief systems that you've, uh, that you've heard, and that you encounter. Just got another idea. So, Like, uh, I was, uh, I don't know if I said this story yesterday, but uh, there was a guy who went with me one time you know, to a nearby state, and uh, he, we did the Dao or just a regular 10 minute jihad workshop. And in the end, he was kind of objecting to it, but in a polite way. He was telling me, I once went to a Dao workshop by Dr. So and so and so, and he gave us a booklet that was this thick. And it had every way to argue against this and that and to refute Trinity and it had this verses and this chapter and that chapter. Well, let me show you something. <clears throat> this is from, uh, I want to show you this page. It's from, uh, actually I think it's probably the same page that's coming up there. This is my Dawa course and this is the page on Trinity. That's how long it is. And, and in the beginning of the course, I tell people to turn to that page and I explain to them why it's that short. Because people would like to get lots of information in this verse and that verse. And if they say this verse, refute it with that verse. And if they try to refute you here, say this and say that. And the thing is that, you know, I tell the students is that if I do that, if I just go online and copy and paste all the known arguments against Trinity, and then paste it into the notes and give it to you, and you pay money to take this course, and then, then I'm really ripping you off. So when we dis we're going to discuss ways of refuting arguments, you know, ways you know of of uh, you know of rebuttal and so on and so forth, and then you can apply them in different situations, or you can refute one one argument through various different ways. Like, uh, and we're going to go through at least you know eight, nine, ten different ways. So you can take any argument, and I can refute it from using this system, using that system or using this style, or using that style. So many different ways to do it. And then, I might ask you some questions towards the end of the day of scenarios that you've never heard of. But you will be, inshallah, ready and able to answer a refute. Why? Because now you have the tools and you can put together your own argument. Most people would like, most people would like that the to, to be given everything. This is how you answer this, that's how you answer that. Okay. And a lot of times you'll discover that the, the short way, you know, to answer the question without referring to scripture, this and that, you, you'll see that inshallah as we go. So, um, let's, uh, let's see. Everyone understand yesterday's, uh, did everyone understand yesterday's uh, exercise, the last one we did, yeah, about, uh, the, about the Prophet <coughs> Because I saw a few people who kept, you know, worrying that, you know, how do I prove to them, uh, you know, well, they don't believe in these uh, sources, hadith, Quran. So how do you prove that to them? How can you convince them? Tell me. I mean, what would their argument be? Essentially, their argument would be that, well, over the years, Muslims have been you know, fixing and taking out everything that would make it clear that he was an imposter, maybe. Is that... Is that an argument? 
None? Why would a non-Muslim not accept your sources? And say, look, we're going to analyze the teachings of Muhammad Sallallahu and his actions. Here we have the teachings of the Quran. It's obviously under the premise that he wrote it. So those are his teachings, right? Or either it's from Allah. So it and then the other thing we're going to analyze how he lived his life from the hadith. So what, why would the kafir object to that? Saying, well, these are your sources. Yes, sir. Okay, but, and, but uh, give me more detail. Why would he object to it? Well, he's I'm never sorry. heard of it before. No? He's never heard of it before, probably. Okay. And uh, he's just assuming... Yes, but, but if I'm sitting with a non-Muslim who tells me, well, I've never heard of these sources before. I'm saying, oh, and? And you have to have heard of everything in the world? What's the argument? What is there? Yes? If Muhammad was uh, literate and could read, then, uh -huh. uh, then he didn't write it himself. You, you're right, but would that be their argument? Yeah, I've heard that argument. Oh, you have, huh? That he didn't write it himself, so he wouldn't know what was written. And if you couldn't read, then you couldn't check it. Oh, okay, check it, I see, okay. But, I mean, we'll, okay. you know, you when you argue, you argue, right? But it's ridiculous, right? Because I can, I can be totally illiterate, and it could just be me and Ziyad, uh, in, in the room, and I say, Ziyad, please write down what I said. I dictate half a page, the ad writes it, right? Then three days later, I call Hamza and say, Hamza, please read this back to me. And then he reads it. There you go, I checked it and I'm illiterate. Come on. It's just weird. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. But why would they ref ref say, look, these are your sources? Because they're saying you could have manipulated them, right? You could have taken out all the parts that prove he wasn't a genuine prophet of Allah. True? So how do you argue that then? How do you argue that point? There's only one from the Quran. Uh -huh. Good. There's only one Quran. We all know that, right? Now, tell me, and there's more than one argument here, tell me how you can prove that to a kafir. There's more. There's only one Quran. How do you prove that to them? Yes, sir. I was uh, praying yesterday in con congregation, uh -huh. and uh, the leader of the prayer was reciting the, the Quran, and he made a mistake, mm -hmm. and he was corrected by someone else. Excellent. So you're, you're saying that, first of all, uh, you know how many people have memorized the Qur'an worldwide, the estimate? No? Anyone? No? Yeah, they say about uh, 10, they say about 11 million people in them are for false worldwide. That is amazing, actually. 11 million people totally memorized the book from beginning to end. So we, you can explain to the non-Muslim in so many ways that this book, it's just one book. I mean, first of all, it's not anything that's like uh, any a miracle. If it's one, if it, if it were more than one copy, we would know, okay? So it's only one. Well, how do you know it's one? Because we don't know if it's a second or a third, it's just one copy of the Qur'an. So if there were three Quran, types of Qur'ans or versions, you think I wouldn't know it? I mean, you know this and I don't know this piece of information? So it's, it's, a, it's not a disputed fact that there's one Qur'an. Okay. I know someone will put their hand up and say, well, you know, this extreme group of the Shia that live in this part of this country have another version. Well, I mean, <coughs> anyway, we, we don't even consider them to be part of the, uh, right? I mean, I'm saying any group that has a different, we don't consider them to be part of Islam anyway. But, so, we know that it's one book, all right, it hasn't been changed. We know it's been memorized by people. We know that if you change one letter, and you have all experienced this in Taraweh, the Imam, when he makes a mistake, how, how is he corrected? <laughs> <laughs> he did, he, then he's still waiting for just one person, please, one person speak. And they all say it again together. <laughs> he does, he, everyone is so in a hurry to correct the imam. It, so it's so detectable if, if one word moves out of place, you know, 11 million people will catch it. And even people who are not Hafaz will catch it, you know? So, there's so many ways you can prove to them that the Qur'an has not changed. One of the ways I used to, when people used to come to my house, I would open, I would get all kinds of uh, masahif, you know, from, uh, with, with that same print, you know, like, uh, and, and then open a big one, small one, one printed this year, one printed ten years ago, and then I say, okay, I know you can't read Arabic, but we're going we're gonna to do this until you say enough. We're going to open the same page, you can't read the miracles, you know, the Arabic numerals, but it looks like a 24, there, there it is, there it is. is this the same page? Yes. You can pick any dot, little dot or scratch on this page. They pick this one, okay, let's find it in every single one of those. 
Okay, next page. We'll open the page, you know, just a random page, all of them to that same page. You can pick any dot. And of course, the, the minute you do two, it's like, okay, I'm with you. So it hasn't changed, not one dot has changed. And there are other ways we discuss how if just one of the dots moves out of place or one of the markers, it throws off the entire sentence, it changes the meaning of the word. Just like, for example, uh, once, uh, sometimes I would write the word Jamal, you know, on a piece of paper twice, right? That's okay, look at that word. Is it the same word? I know you can't read Arabic. Yeah, it's the same word. Then I put a Shadda on the meme. It becomes what? Jamal, which means? Yeah, like he has beautified or he has adorned something. So now from camel, we have a, a pronoun added, we have a verb that is in the past tense, all of that from this little marker here. So if I'm reading a sentence and instead of getting on the camel, he get on that he has beautified, am I going to catch that or what? For sure I'm going to catch it. So the language won't allow changes and so on and so forth. So this, these are the teachings of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if the, the book had changed in any way, we, and people were allowed through his, you know, throughout history to change it and alter and so on and so forth, then it would be so easy, then it would be clear, because now we'll see, um, you will see the different political trends, how every time it will change during this century, during this era, it will change, during this dynasty, it will change, and we'll have probably more than one copy, because, you know, the Fatimiyin would have their copy, the Abbasids would have their copy, the Umayyads would have their copy, and it would be just like with the Bible now. I mean, they actually have a chart that traces how the Bible came to be. And you would just see this copy, that copy, this branch, that branch. So why would, what, how come you can trace your alterations of your book and we just, the only, we're totally oblivious to the fact that there was more than one. Uh, anyway, yes, sister? How about you argue about translations? Because the Bible then you can Okay, so, uh, you know, what if someone argues that there are different translations of the same verses? Of course, these are translations of the meanings, right? And the meanings can vary a little bit here and there. And that's not really a problem. Because, you know, when it comes to, like, uh, like, the, like the basic beliefs, you don't find any the things that are clear in the Qur'an. You don't find some scholars saying this, others saying that about some of the very clear things in the Qur'an. But there might be a little bit of a difference of what they thought this story happened in this story or what was the incident related to this story. That, that really doesn't affect the Qur'an being a book that's not changed. It's still, it's still a book that's it's one book. It hasn't been altered. It hasn't been changed or anything. Anyway, so that's how you show them this is your... Um, this is, yeah, the source. These are the sources that you were going to use. What about hadith? They tell you, well, what if people have changed the hadith over the years and said, well... <coughs> They moved, the, they moved away the part that he slept all night and said he prayed all night till his feet became swollen. How about that? And basically, primarily, it's the same argument, you know. And you can give them a quick rundown of how hadith was collected and that there wasn't some joke. Some Muslims think that hadith just, whoever said something, they wrote it down and became the hadith, you know. So you tell them how intricate and detailed the system was. And so these are the sources that we're going to use. The argument that, well, you're using your sources, it's it's not a valid argument whatsoever. And anyone says that to you, just tell them, come on, let's, let's get real here. That's not how we do things anywhere in the world. You know, one time, some nonsense tried to, tried to argue with me. It was a ridiculous argument. He said, uh, well, these things are not in Western books, so therefore, I don't believe them. Yeah, what kind of an argument is it? I spoke to my history professor about that. And he was saying, what, what kind of an argument is that? So, for example, a lot of things that happened in Chinese history, they're in the Chinese history books. You know, England had no clue what was going on in China. So why would you expect them to be in English uh, history books? You know? Same thing, the history of Africa. Yeah, yeah, I remember I was telling one guy about how during the reign of Umar bin Abdul Aziz, that they couldn't find a single poor person to give the zakah money to in all of Africa, or in all of Africa that was under their control. So then they used the zakah money to, to buy it slaves and set them free. So Nanusim said, I, I don't believe that. Because it's too much for him. Because here we are talking about Muslim <coughs> village and democracy and technology and freedom, all these things. Look at Africa today. You mean look at wealth in one part of the world and look at Africa today. So, you know, and there you think they, that they run the world and everything and, and they can't take care of Africa until now. And then the Muslims in our history, we took care of Africa. So I said, I don't believe it. 
Well, based on what? You know, because it's not in your books and your sources. You don't expect it to be in your sources. And tell me the Aborigines didn't exist because you know, you know, in the 16th century there was nothing about them and about their history. Who is their leader? Or is that right? So if you don't know them, they're not there, huh? It's like when you discovered America, right? If you didn't know it was there, it was not discovered. Even though there were folks living there. All right. Anyways. Um, <clears throat> shall we have some fun or shall we... Uh... Yeah. Have some fun. <laughs> yes, sir? <coughs> some of the brothers, when you're talking to them, right? Um, I don't want to mention what, what like, their brother they belong to. Yeah, just mention their name. <laughs> but they start quoting ahadith, which I know from people like yourself and other ulama, is that, that they are not sort of like they're basically not quoting hadith at all. So how do you tackle them at that point then? That it's not authentic hadith? Well, they are basically completely fabricated ahadith mm -hmm. on the Aliyah al or on the Ahlul Bayt or... Okay, I see, I see. I see. Uh, but uh, let's actually that's one of our questions. Remember, she asked Sunna, right? So we'll, and uh, that's what we talk about, obviously. <laughs> but um, so, and you can feel free to mention that it's not an issue. Yeah. But it's like you wouldn't mention a, a, a group within the Sunni. Yeah. You wouldn't tell me, you know, Ikhwan is said or Tablil. That you would you would keep aside. But Shia, yeah, Shia, yeah, it's not a problem. You know how? Uh, have you heard the history of the sect? Yeah? Oh, man, what's going on, people? Sheikh Walid was Sunni. Don't play around with Sheikh Walid. Anything Sheikh Walid, you get it, you listen to it. That's how it works. <laughs> yeah, anything Sheikh Walid, don't fool around. You guys are aware of that, right? If you're not, you are now. <laughs> Sheikh Walid was Sunni. That's it. I'm going to start with Sheikh Walid. I'm serious. Sheikh Walid. That's it. <laughs> I'm not kidding. <laughs> I don't play around with Sheikh Walid <laughs> With all due respect to everybody else, I don't play around with Sheikh Walid. Ever. I remember one time, people don't know who they're messing with. Like. They don't know who they're messing with. These two young kids. Who has more knowledge of Sheikh Walid or Sheikh so and so? That guy goes, This is the expert. They're about equal. I said, Let me put your two heads together and maybe smack you or something. So I'm it with you. You don't know who you're messing with. Sheikh Walid was uni, people. Don't play around. I'm serious. I don't play around when it comes to Sheikh Walid. In North America, all you gotta do is say Sheikh Walid was uni. And I say, yeah, yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. You're right. That's it. Don't play around with Sheikh Walid. I don't know if I can stress that enough. So when his course comes, spend the night here. Don't come early. Spend the night here. I'm serious. When his course comes to town, you spend the night here. I'm not kidding, Echi. You spend the night in his room. You spend the night in the room in the morning, you brush your teeth, whatever. You sit and wait. Okay. I know you think I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. Okay. So, uh, where was we? Don't get me started. Oh yeah, so I was saying, uh, yeah, you want to have some fun or get some, the brother said fun, right? So, uh, <clears throat> Ahmed, can I see the questions, Yafid? I know these are your notes, Yafid. Maybe you can give me the, I don't know, it's a table. Don't tear it out. Okay, let me just ask this question first. Can we get uh, can we get two volunteers to be partners and come down here? Oh, only okay. one. Come on, someone else. One of the older brothers. Huh? It's not gonna be that bad. Bad. We don't have another microphone, do we?
All right, so you're the you're the Dawa team. Right? Yeah, inshallah. So keep this mic like, don't bring it too close. Just keep it like between you like that. As long as you don't blow on it. So you're going to tell us, uh, you, we're going to, we're going to ask you one of these questions. And then you, as a team, you can answer, right? So this is anonymous I'm asking you. And uh, I think I should have said, I should have warned you before what I'm just going to do. But uh, feel free to just answer any way you'd like, OK? Mm, I'm, I'm going to pick a nice one. <laughs> okay, I'll give you a choice. That way, you can choose between Aisha's age, or polygamy, or polygyny, and or how do we know which sect in Islam is the true sect? Pick one of these. All right, great. But so, uh, and then you guys can feel free if if you have the difficult questions to throw in to their explanations. Yes. Feel free. But, so the first thing is, uh, the non-Muslim asks you, you know, why did your Prophet marry a young girl? Yeah, why did he marry a young girl? And that's, so, not, and that's not appropriate. You, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so why did our, our met the Messenger of Allah, so Allah, why did he was so long, marry Aisha radiallahu anha at a young age? Yes. And so how many years ago, do you know how many years ago that was? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, about 1400. About 1400 years ago, okay. And uh, what, what was the, uh, today's, today, you know, the average male and female lived to about uh, 70 or 80, is that correct? 75. 75, okay, great. <laughs> I'm making it up. <laughs> and, and what do you think it was about 1400 years ago? Can you just answer my question? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Okay, take your time. Yeah, you know, you know they, they say for a simple question, uh -huh. you give a long answer. Oh, is that right? I didn't know that. Okay, keep going. And for a, for a complex answer, you give a simple answer. Okay, <laughs> anyways. <laughs> so, so the uh, age span, what do you think it was 1400 years ago? I have no clue. Okay, it was about, uh, females used to live maybe about 40, 50, and uh, people used to have about sometimes 8 to 12 kids, just to, just to keep the life cycle going. So I so now do you think a, a young girl back then looked like a young girl today? With the exact same, you know? The Probably. backpack going to school and you know, maybe uh, you know, a doll in her hand. Do you think that that's how a, a young girl looked back then? Probably, Probably not. Ago? But Probably no. not. But would you marry a ten year old today? Do you <laughs> but, first of all, I believe she was she was nine years old. I shall really love one. Would you marry a nine year old? Sorry? Would you marry a nine-year-old today? Today? No, I would not. Because, uh, like I said, a nine-year-old today is not the same as a nine-year-old back then. Now, if you're against the act of, of, of someone marrying a, a, a uh, you know, if, you, if you're saying throughout history no one should marry uh, someone that young, then you're pretty much condemning 60% of humanity. Because that's, because I, I, can, I can guarantee you that, that, Women from, from from the time that they were seven used to marry. You can just look at take a look at history, and you know prove me wrong that that, that did not occur. Or would your friend there marry a ten year old? <laughs> <laughs> no, in this day and age, I wouldn't marry a ten year old. But do you think it's okay to marry a ten year old at fourteen hundred years ago? Absolutely. At that time, um, it was a common practice. And another thing that we need to understand is that the marriage wasn't consummated right as soon as they got married at that young age. Was consummated later. The contract was just done at that time. Okay, but and I'm gonna stop you there. Exactly. Okay. You know why I stopped you there? Excellent. Exactly. Very good. Uh, I actually stopped them there because they were they were doing a superb job. Farah. What's your name? Aubrey Basil. Basil and Salman. Salman. But Basil, he started off really, really excellent. I mean, it was really, really good. Superb, superb, superb. Because if you really pay attention, yani, he didn't allow himself to be backed into the coin. There were some people, if they stood here and I just started to ask those simple questions, they would immediately start going backwards. He started, he didn't start answering immediately. He started asking, which was excellent. I mean, he's really saying, what, yani, who is telling you that, what, that the way you're looking at it is the correct way? So he started immediately talking about 1400 years ago. First he started to say, how long ago was this? Do you know? You know, it's not like a 10-year-old with a backpack, you still play the Barbie dolls and 
I mean, people now, subhanAllah, not only do they, okay, so Beth and Aisha, and also describe being physically, you know, larger, people used to mature quickly. I mean, now, people don't mature sometimes at all. <laughs> yeah, and it's, subhanAllah, you know something? You know, you know, when we grew up, you know, our parents were respectable people, you know. Your dad was a res respectable guy. And for me, my dad was a very dignified guy. And, and for me, that was an important part of growing up. And I never saw, I never grew up with my dad doing dumb things around the house. He never did dumb things around the house. He never jumped around and, and danced at parties or, or played video games in front of me. And I always think that if my dad played video games in front of me, I would uh, turn out worse. I'm not going to say turn out horrible, but turn out worse. You know? Because. But now look at the new look at new generations. And those of you who are dads who play video games in front of your child, what on earth is that all about? <laughs> and do all kinds of weird things in front of your kids. It's weird. So I know I'm not really but what I'm trying to say is that you I wonder at and I used to go get my hair cut in this place for two years. And obviously I haven't been there in two years, right? <laughs> so the these guys they were grown men and they had children, multiple children, and uh, every time I go get my hair cut and they talk to each other. And every sentence begins and ends with dude, and it has dude in the middle. <laughs> and they play video games, and that's all they talk about. They talk about sports or a video game. You know, what level are you at, dude? Dude, I'm here. Or dude. That's all they do. And these are fathers, people, and they're so immature. And I used to wonder, when I first came down to the States, I used to wonder at how immature people were. Someone would be in his 20s, and he's so immature. And in Sudan, you find a 13-year-old girl, if her mother is traveling or away, she will cook and prepare you know, food for the entire house and a real meal, not just like heat up some you know, you know, toasty frosts or whatever it is. <laughs> she'll cook up real food, the house will be clean, and she'll do her homework, and if she has younger kids, she'll take care of them. And she's still a young girl, she doesn't lose her childhood and traumatize and all the garbage that they say now. Just a normal thing. Now I'd come here, people in their 20s, immature. I used to listen to this show, you know that doctor on the radio? I don't know if you have her here, but Dr. Laura, very famous, and, and people call her with their problems. And I remember this when I first arrived in the States, I would listen to the radio show, and, she, and people, some guy would call her, Hi, Dr. Laura. <laughs> I have a problem. It's okay, this guy must be like 17 or something. And she would say, How old are you? I'm 45. <laughs> and I'd, uh, What's the matter with you? 45? So people don't mature, so now what uh, Basil was saying, he's saying, look, and if he started asking, you know how long ago this was, you know? He started describing the girl with the backpack. It was just excellent. I, you could have kept go doing a great job, both of you, Salman and, and Basil, but uh, I stopped you because you were doing excellent. The whole point, I wanted to see if you were going to back yourself into a corner or not, you know? And you weren't accepting the, these questions of, you know, do you think it's okay? And then and you just start apologizing, and suddenly you magically turn her age into 18. You know how the Muslims are doing that now, right? And in the course of their arguments, they're maligning and attacking the scholars of Islam and saying, he wasn't reliable. Is this how we do it? We even attack our scholars just to bring the age magically to 18? And why just 18? Why just does it have to match the, the famous legal age? And it is not really 18 everywhere in the States. You know, I don't know what it is here. 18? You know, we still have some states where it's 14 until today, 16, 17, and the majority are 18. So, who is to say that the way you look at something now is the right way? And this is what, this is the problem. People always look at the way they believe and the way they live now. That's the standard. Who made it the standard? You know? Anyways. I'm going to come into that in, in more detail, but I just wanted to see how, and I think you guys did a superb job, Dr. Makhaira, you were not you know, moving backwards and allowing yourself to be painted to a corner. We're going to come into maybe Aisha and do it more you know, in, in steps. Go ahead. Just a question. Same thing that they did, can you then bring it back to Tawheed by saying, how does that affect you worshiping one God? Or bring it back I mean, to yes, definitely you can bring it back to Tawheed. Remember the, the rule is that... You know, your main talk is Tawheed, but what if someone has an issue that's really important to them? They need to know this issue, right? So then you address it, and then you can come back to Tawheed. Sister? Um, I'd uh, uh, say what you said yesterday, that uh, even if you don't believe in Allah, you still believe in 
said about book quality is mad and so on and so on. They didn't say here at Muhammad married the Aisha in the age night. This means that it was normal in this age. And even my grandmother uh, has, was married when she is 12. MashaAllah. So it's normal at the, maybe 100 years that we can marry in this age. Excellent. Very good. Very good. Excellent. We're actually going to get, don't worry, we'll come back to these and, and, and look at the arguments for the age of Aisha. One, two, three, four, five, like that. And then you can use any combination of them. Now, I want to do something about answering questions. And this is what I was so pleased with what Basit did. A lot of du'as think their job is to answer the non-Muslims' questions. That's it. Just like, you know, the information booth, people come up and where do I go, you know, get my luggage? Yeah. Where do I go? You know, my ticket over there. That's not what your job is. And so, do not just answer questions and don't accept the premise of that question. So, for example, let's take some examples. Um, someone will ask you, why is it, and this is actually here. And, and actually, this is the way I worded, but it was worded just like that, but from the brother who suggested it, and Ahmed wrote it down. Why, who would like to put their hand up and answer this question? Why does Allah need us to worship Him? A non-Muslim comes to you, why does Allah need us to worship Him? This was the question that was asked yesterday. Who would like to put their hand up and answer the question? Why does Allah need us to worship Him? Young man in the back? Oh, mashallah. Good man, that's it. You don't need to finish. You see what he did? He did it right, 100%. I don't care what he says after that sentence, he's right. He said, Allah doesn't need us. He was about to say to worship him. There you go. You fix the question first, and then you explain. <coughs> Don't say because, and then you start. No matter what you say, you're wrong, because the non-Muslim still walks away with Allah needs us to worship him, and he doesn't. You fix the question first. Don't just answer, answer, answer. Someone asks you, can Allah create a four-sided triangle? And you start to answer immediately. I don't waste time with a question like this. I won't answer that question. Say, yeah, unless you're an idiot, the minute you have four sides, it's a rectangle or a square. <laughs> no such thing as a four-sided triangle. What did you study? So, of course you don't really say that, right? But, but why would you start to answer a question like this? Or the other one about the rock. You know that one, right? Did you tell you, can Allah create or can God create a rock that is so huge that no living thing can move it? And most Muslims are, yes. <laughs> and they ask them, then can God move it? And of course people say, yes. <laughs> that means he can't create a rock that is so huge that no living thing can move it because he can move it. <laughs> then suddenly the Muslims are, what are you going to do? The problem is you put yourself in the wrong place to begin with. You know, don't start just answering questions. It's not your job to answer questions. The da'iyah, you guide them to the truth. You're not just here to answer questions and then they've got these little traps ready for you and you fall into the traps. So, you know, and of course, the answer, the, the answer to this question, the answer to this question, it tells you, can, can, can God create a rock that's so big that nothing can move it? No living thing can move this rock. Yes, he can create that rock. Then they ask you, can he move the rock? If you say no, that's a problem. If you say yes, he can move it, that means he can't create a rock that no one can move, because he can move it. It's just garbage. So then, uh, and, that's, and this is what, where do we benefit from this example? We benefit when they come and tell you, you know, if, if, you know, if God wanted to do something, can anyone stop him? No. Okay, then he could have had a son. Just stop arguing. You could have had a son then. Well, who's going to stop him from having a son? And that's why you tell them, with the rock, with the sun, tell them that Allah Azza wa only does things that befit His Majesty. That's it. Allah Azza wa only does things that befit His Majesty. And so, that's why when the, the non-Muslim comes to me with things like that, I'll ask them, can God lie? Can He steal? Can He murder? And of course they say, no, why not? Because He only does things that befit His Majesty. So this you're talking about, picking up rocks, moving rocks, all these are human characteristics that you're giving to Allah Azza wa Jalla. And Allah Azza wa Jalla only does things that befit His Majesty. 
So don't ask me about four-sided triangles. Don't ask me about all these things. These are all things that, that deal with human beings, you know. And you're trying to give these human qualities to, to God, and you're asking these kinds of questions. So Allah only does things that befit His Majesty, and it doesn't befit His Majesty to have a son. You see. So don't just get into the business of answering questions. And I think I told you the story during the Power of One conference about the, the guy who asked me, you know, why do Muslims grow their beards, right? I told you that one. No. Yeah. Okay, no, I did. No. So, so basically, I mean, we were working at this company, a lot of Muslims, and this non-Muslim said to me, why do Muslims grow their beard? So again, you could answer, well, this was the way of the Prophet of Allah and the way of all the Prophets before him. But you know what? You shouldn't be asking me that question. You shouldn't be asking me that question. So I'm not going to answer that like that just immediately. So I said, look, I understand why you're asking me that question. Why do I understand? Because everybody shaves, right? That's why I understand. Everybody shaves, so you're asking me why I grow my beard. So I said, I understand why you're asking me that question, given the environment in which we live. But the truth is, I don't grow it. It just comes out by itself. You know? I mean, I don't put manure in the morning, and go and lay out in the sun a little bit, and then put some rainwater on it, whatever it is, and hope it grows. You know? It just grows by itself. I told him now, because naturally when a male reaches puberty, he develops facial hair. And I told him right now, if you tell a child, you give a child a piece of paper, and say, draw the face of a man, the face of a woman, the child will immediately add facial hair to the man, because males develop facial hair. And it comes out by itself naturally. So it's so it's actually the natural thing to let your hair grow. The unnatural thing is when you insist on removing every stubble of hair every morning, you know, and then cutting yourself and then putting the cologne and it all burns just so you can look like that guy in the commercial. <laughs> so he actually said to me, you know what? He actually said this, you're right. I never thought of it like that. You should be asking me why I shave. You see? Now, you don't have to accept what I'm telling you. You can just answer the question the way you want to ask it. You know, you can say, well, our Prophet grew his beard, and he commanded us to grow our beard, and that was the way of all the Prophets, and then it sets you apart from the Kuffar, it sets you apart from the women, and then, and you so the being the commander of the Prophet said, that, well, that's it. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But I just don't want him to be thinking in his mind that the norm and the right is what he's doing, and I'm the one doing something that's, that's out of, uh, you know, that's different. No, I should be asking you. You're the one doing something weird. Alright? So anyways, so your job is not just to answer questions. But now when questions do arise and arguments do arise, what are certain ways that we can uh, yeah, I mean, refute or explain away? So there are a number of ways. Uh, one, of the, one of the ways, of course, you know, and you've probably all done this, and we did this yesterday, with the question about the war. You know, most people die because of religion, and most wars in the world are because of religion. You can refute this. One of the ways you can refute it, as we did yesterday, using facts, using statistics, right? And of course, you've all probably done this, using science to prove something related to an act of worship. You've probably mentioned some scientific or physical benefits of, uh, of uh, fasting, and so on and so forth. So one, you can use facts, you can use statistics, right? And everyone, everyone see how you can do that? Yeah? Anyone confused about that? It's very clear, right? So someone give us another example where you can use a fact or a statistic or something to prove something. Like just now we did it with the age of Aisha. We're saying, you know, you know for, as a fact, you know, you have in, in some states 14 is a legal age to get married. We use a fact here. We use a, some, some kind of, uh, yeah? Uh, that drinking alcohol isn't harmful. So you look at the stats that uh, it's not harmful? Yeah, the, I mean, the yeah, argument that it's harmful. Okay. That, uh, and you look, you say, you say well, uh, just one of its harms, one of its like, many related harms, is like uh, uh, drunk driving. Uh, like, I think it was like uh, 10 people uh, died per week. Okay. Did you guys know that fact? 10 people die a week from drunk driving? What is this, uh, just here? This is uh, World North America? In the U.S. In the U.S. Okay. So now this is a fact. You see how you, you throw that fact in when it comes to alcohol? You can throw a bad fact to show something haram. You can throw a good fact about, you know, siyam. You can throw another fact, someone, other example. Yes? Uh, the Albanian guy told me in Bosnia, for every man there's 21 women. So if every man marries just one woman, it's going to be a problem. And even if they marry four, they would, 
there's going to be a problem. We're going to have to help them <laughs> by finding people that can. Uh -huh. So, so here is using statistics to show the Sunnah of the makes sense. Another fact. Oh, man, that's a disgusting fact. <laughs> really? 30 years old? The average video gamer is 30 years old. 30 years old. Yeah, I hate video games. It's such a problem. Grown men. <laughs> got blisters on their thumbs. Grown men. Yes, sir. Sorry, sister, I'll get to you. Yes. The average age that in some places people lose their virginity is between 14 and 13 years there old. There you go. That's, that's a fact. That's average, thing. so there's obviously lower. Yes, that's average. So you can throw that fact when you're discussing the whole Aisha thing. Yes? I, I don't know the number exactly, but I can search about it. Uh, how many people uh, died in the uh, war of, uh, because of the nuclear uh, bomb in Japan? Aywa, Jamil, Jamil Jitten. How many people died in Hiroshima? One million. Yeah. One million? Not 1.5. Okay, one million. Fine. How about how many people died in estimated World War Two? Yeah, the estimates anywhere from 55 to as high as 65 million people. So that's a fact that you're using, yes, sir. I just want to add to the brother's uh, comment on the uh, the virginity thing. Mm -hmm. um, in the UK, according to statistics, mm -hmm. uh, out of every seven girls who are under the age of 15, before they graduate from the GCSEs, which is like a high school there, uh, three of them are actually pregnant. Oh, good enough. Yeah. How about I, I'll add another fact here. Look at this fact, unbelievable. It shows you about how wicked zina is. They tell you that 82% of teenage mothers are themselves the daughters of teenage mothers. Isn't that amazing? 82% of, of teenage mothers are themselves the daughters of teenage mothers. And zina just keeps going down the generations, you know? So, all right, another fact. I'm on polygamy in the U.S. Uh, like 98% of them are men in jail, and plus science shows that uh, women actually live 10 years more than men. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's like 25 million gays in what's it, in America anyway, so that's just considered um, statistics. So like, I heard um, that if every guy and girl got married in America, there'd be 7.8 million women who wouldn't be able to get one. So what, then, then you guys are going to have to help them out. So, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Last one. In uh, World War II, the women in Germany, they were protesting to, uh, for the men to have a second wife. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. They Is that to... right? <laughs> Let's relocate, brothers. <laughs> <laughs> so we can stop this movement. <laughs> uh, you know, I can't, really, I can't resist the uh, <laughs> I looked up the whole Michael Jackson thing yesterday. Oh, <laughs> I might have to go to Bahrain, you know. <laughs> but there is a, a lawsuit of $4.5 million. But you know, if someone says it's Shahada, that's it, right? So, anyways. Uh, okay, so everyone sees now. Omar, you want to add something? I just have a question. You want? Heart? Yeah, it should be liver. Yeah. It's usually the liver. The study says the liver. <laughs> but, uh. I don't know. Like, I thought it actually destroys the liver, mm. but it actually reduces the fat on your heart. Mm. Because one of the doctors in the U.S. actually, um, he said he's not going to advertise on this wine, which was like a new product. And because of this fact, it actually destroys the liver. Okay, fine. So, once again, let me just answer the alcohol question. Unless that's related to the alcohol, go ahead. Um, just about the alcohol, it, that study hasn't been conclusively accepted or proven yet. Okay. And then there's another one that disputes it, so it's still ongoing. Toy. So it okay, is this about alcohol? Um, yes. Uh, I, I just think it's interesting that the Quran says that there are benefits also to alcohol and to gambling. Uh huh. The, the Excellent. The ways that they Thank you. So, I'm not, I'm not right? So basically, when uh, when someone tells you, yeah, the, you know, the study shows that alcohol reduces fat from your eyeballs or whatever it is, so no problem, no problem. I know that because the Quran actually said that there is good and there is bad in it. See now, now realistically, 
it's talking about wine, and there's not the, the good is actually not in the alcohol. It's if you're talking about wine, it's and that study is with wine. Yeah, it studies with wine. So uh, there are actually antioxidants in the wine, not in the alcohol itself. And so uh, the now, but Allah tells us that there is good and there is bad in it. But the bad outweighs the good. So if you're telling me that there's some good in it, now I'm going to ask you worldwide: Is it benefiting more livers or harming more livers? No doubt, it's harming more livers. That's why Allah tells us that the bad in it outweighs the good. And then it destroys your wealth, and then it takes away your dignity and your honor, and your so many things. So we know that there is good. Allah told us that many years ago, before your journal came out with this study. So we know it, but the bad outweighs it. So that's not a problem, you know. So that's why. Okay, um, someone else had their hand up about this. Yeah. support groups and they believe they can still be Muslim and gay. This is their link. These people are the billah. That's what he would, this is their leader. This is, he would send this email and then everyone in the masjid list would get it and then the closet, uh, the closet gay brothers would uh, click on that link and then join the support group, you know? So anyways, type, uh, okay, let me do this. Let me finish my, okay, well actually since we're doing facts and statistics, by the way, science in the Quran falls under this category, right? Uh, science in the Quran, let's talk about it right now, it has a few issues with it, okay? Uh, there, is, there are actually you know, legitimate science books in the, uh, in the library, not written about Islam or with the idea of, of Islam in mind, just written about science that have things contradicting to all the scientific facts that are in A Brief Illustrative Guide to Understanding Islam. You know, everything from the mountains as pegs to the plate tectonics to the oceanography, Many, many things contradicting to that. So, not all science is science, and, uh, and uh, maybe that's, uh, actually we're having a webinar tomorrow, I think. Yeah. So if you, maybe I'll get the information if anyone wants to listen to that, we're gonna talk about that, that not all science is science. So when you use science in the Quran, be careful, all right? Try to use the very, very clear, strong things that cannot, that, that don't get you to too much dispute. Science in the Qur'an is one of the tools you use to prove the veracity of the message or to prove that the Qur'an wasn't written by the Prophet said it. And it's not necessarily what will get people to become Muslim. And a lot of du'a think that's what will get people to become Muslim. You tell them there's a scientific fact and it's in the Qur'an. And I remember one, one person was telling me, this lawyer came in, she said, okay, why should I become a Muslim? So he immediately said, there is a lot of science in the Qur'an. She said, stop. He said, I'm not going to become Muslim because there's science in the Qur'an. What will Islam do for me? You know? So sometimes we use science in the Qur'an to prove, like what we were doing yesterday, the Prophet couldn't have written the Qur'an, he had to have been a genuine Prophet of Allah. Allah but, uh, I mean, I, and I'm not, never say never with da'wah, but I've yet to hear of any story of some guy who became Muslim just because of the science in the Qur'an. And you would think that any human being, once they read, let's say that you give them a book that has all the science in the Qur'an, when they're convinced that, okay, this book must be from Allah, what do you think their next step is? Okay, let's see what it says about everything else. Let's see what it says about me and worshipping Allah and Allah Azza wa Himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, signs in the Qur'an is one of the things you, you add on to your da'wah or you supplement your da'wah with. It's not your da'wah. It's not. It really isn't. Okay? It's one of the things. So, Facts, statistics, we excellent examples, everyone give examples, so we all see how you can use facts to support you know, your arguments. And uh, let's go into talking about, uh, about gays. 
and uh, we can use science again and facts. So some people say that it's a gene, all right? And uh, any doctors in the house, any people stay in medicine? Come on, Calgary, what's going on? That's weird. That's strange, okay. Good, good. I'm happy, actually. I'm tired of our MDs. Um, so uh, let's, let's use, so now they, they tell you that, well, look at this, where should we start? There's so many arguments against this. One, they tell you that, well, you know, God created me this way, or it's a gene. First of all, science has not proven that it's a gene. There is no scientific argument whatsoever, ever, that it's a gene. Two, for sure, 100%, there will never, ever be any science to prove that it is a gene. Why? Because Allah Azza wa Jalla says in, in Surah Al-A'raf, قُلْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَأْمُرُ بِالْفَحْشَاءِ أَتَقُولُونَ عَلَى اللَّهِ مَا لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Allah Azza wa Jalla does not command evil. Yani why would Allah create someone with a gene that makes him gay and then take him to the hellfire for the way he created him? Does that sound fair to you? Never. قُلْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَأْمُرُ بِالْفَحْشَاءِ Allah doesn't command evil. So if Allah created him with the evil gene in him, that means Allah is commanding him to that evil. And then punishes him for the way he made him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. doesn't make sense. So that's why science will never, ever prove that it's a gene. Another reason, scientifically, why science will never prove that it's a gene, because um, uh, how many chromosomes does a human being have? 23. None? 23? 23 pairs. None? 23 pairs. 23 pairs. 23 pairs. So 46, right? So now, with identical twins, uh, if you know this fact or not, identical twins have the same exact chromosomes. They have done studies where identical twins, one of them was straight and the other was gay. Thank you. One of them was straight, the other was gay. And so they have the exact identi identical genes or chromosomes, yet one is gay and one is straight. So that means it can't be a gene. You understand this, right? And you know, by the way, that they can see the, the human chromosomes. You know, they can actually see them. And uh, the, you know, so you can see both are exactly the same, and yet one is gay and the other is not, which means that it's something mental. And, and that's why there are actually clinics now where people go, and they go through therapy, and then they come out hetero, and they get married, and they have children, and they never return to the wicked deed again. You see? So that means the fact that you can be cured from it shows you that it's an illness to begin with, and it's actually a mental illness. If you want to look up, there is a, is a doctor, his name is Joseph... Nicolosi, like N I C O L O S I. Yeah? Look him up, it's amazing. He has a clinic and it's quite popular. People go and they get treatment and they come out normal. And he traces, you know, homosexuality to be alienation from, from males or from male peers, and from males in the earlier part of life and from male peers in the latter part, part of life. And he traces it to, to, a psycho, to psychology, you know? It's not a gene. Allah did not create people in a way and then punish them for being the way he created them, it doesn't make any sense. So, it, and, and beyond that, they've, they've never located this gene. I mean, how many genes are there in, the, in one human being? They look at all of them and they can't see the gay gene. It's, where is it hiding? At? So, uh, him in the closet. Too. <laughs> uh, there are also logical arguments against it, you know? Logical arguments again. You know, like, I mean, have you read the argument that tells you oh, it's available in the animal kingdom? First of all, I, I'm still in doubt of that. I've never. Go ahead. Uh, I think it was Sheikh Bilal Fadlosi talked about those arguments that it's in the animal kingdom. Uh, it was either the in the animal, like the animal proof or the gene proof. But he said that uh, somebody published a paper on that and it was put in like medical journals. But later on, it was proven that. Uh, all their research was faulty and they didn't, like, no one went over that research as well. But also, in, uh, another argument against the animal kingdom, one is, let's say there are animals, <coughs> let's just say there is an animal that exhibits homosexual behavior, that's one animal in the entire animal kingdom, and also there are animals that eat their, eat their young. Thank you. And Those are the exact ones I was coming to Bart Levy. Yeah, and he looks, forget one animal that's gay. I don't care if there's a herd of a million zebras or all homos. Okay? 
Since when on earth is the animal kingdom a, 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 guide, a guide and a model for us? And if there's a million homo zebras, that we should be homos or something? If animals eat other animals, we should we should eat other other people? You know, animals go. To, you know, when you go to the zoo, an animal just lick its tail and drop. You know, it's uh, it's you know. Now, does that, do we act like? Since when are animals role models for us? I don't care what they do. I mean. There hasn't been any study that has proven that. But suppose all the animals on earth were gay. So first of all, they would all be dead within 30 years. No animals would exist. So just logically, no species can continue with that, you know? So, uh, um, and I'm sorry, we're going to cut it off with the, with, the, with the gay argument here. But of course, you can look it up. It's, every argument has already been done. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. But I just wanted to tell you the story of when I was there. You know what a gay dar is? <laughs> so, you know, your ability to detect the uh, gay person, your radar, gaydar. So I have very, very weak gaydar. And, uh, anyone have a strong gaydar? Yeah? My younger brother, he, he, he doesn't have to go beyond this to know that that person is gay. He's got a very strong gaydar. For me, we're giving down in the street and I'm talking to this guy. And I keep talking to him, going over the basics. Makes sense? Makes sense. I go for the gold. He says, I can't. My lifestyle won't allow it. He said, sure it can. And I keep talking to him. You know? <laughs> then I go for the gold again. He says, my lifestyle won't, lifestyle won't allow it. He said, no, no, don't worry about it, this and that. And then again, I go for the gold. He says, my lifestyle won't allow it. I said, what lifestyle? He said, look, I've been doing this for years. I've been talking to people. I've never heard somebody say lifestyle. What is your lifestyle? He said, I'm gay. <laughs> <laughs> And only after he said that did I suddenly realize that the guy is wearing a pink t-shirt and he's also got that gay sleeve. It's not like here and it's not cut. It's like this. You know what I'm talking about? Only then I started to notice that and how he's standing and how his bones are loose. You know, how the gays have loose bones, you know? So, so then, you know, we were for, there was that second of, you know, and then uh, and then you know what? What do you do? Leave him. What do you do? Leave him. What do you do after that? Yes, sir. Give more dollars to him. Uh huh. Okay. Now, good. Now you know what? He kept saying my lifestyle. You know the truth is, it's not a lifestyle. It's not. It's just a desire. Don't accept the argument that it's a lifestyle. It's a desire. And yeah, since one is a desire, a lifestyle. Yeah, and. You, I don't ask Ziyad, Ziyad, what's your lifestyle? Oh, I'm hetero. <laughs> Why isn't hetero a lifestyle? And gay is a lifestyle. Homo is a lifestyle and hetero is not. It's not a lifestyle, it's just a desire. And it's just when the people ask me, you know, Brother Khan, what's your lifestyle? Well, I have sushi, you know. <laughs> I mean, I desire sushi, I like sushi. But it's not a lifestyle. Since one is a desire a lifestyle. They're putting too much, they're giving it too much, this thing. It's just a dirty desire. And it's not, don't make it a lifestyle. And they've, but, but in a way, in a weird way, they are a little smart when it comes to becoming known. They have made it a right, you see? And so that they have the gay rights movement. <laughs> and because, you know, in the States at least, people are so attached to people having their rights and, and everyone wants everyone to have a right and there's so much, everything, people think everything is a right and it's not sometimes. But it's my right to do this and it's actually not your right to do it. But so the gay movement has become a rights movement. And that's why now they get support for it and they get all kinds of things. While it was actually known to be a mental illness since as early as 1938 it has been diagnosed as a mental illness. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, as early as Freud. And the, the DSM, which is this manual that psychologists put out every year. And it has Any psychologists in the audience? Okay, okay, good. You know, the, uh, so the DSM, yeah? It's used here, right? So it, it used to list all the men mental illnesses every year. Homosexuality was listed as a mental illness until it was removed in the in the like uh, late 60s or in that era, right? 80s. 80s? I thought it was the 70s. Come on. Are you sure? Just oh. The new oh, sorry. Just the new edition is the one. Uh huh. So okay. So the sister saying it was removed in the 80s, you know, because of the, because of political pressure. And so that's why so many people now don't know that it's actually a mental illness because they were forced to take it out of the book. But it actually is an illness. 
So they made it a lifestyle, they made it a right, but it's not. It's just a mental illness. People can get help with that, you know. So, so my thing now is, someone says, you know, you can, in, in a way, say you can get help with that. You know, you can get help, you know. But until you go through therapy, I want you to always be in the front row. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> make that much. Oh. Yes, sir. Like in, in England, it has come to a point, like in these GAP stores, like GAP, like it's come to a state like where they actually call it gay and proud. And if you look at the managers, like the, the people who are actually managing the stores, mm. they're mainly of this sort as well. So really? they're like very, very pro-GAP, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. It's a GAP! Right, so we've got a boycott GAP. Right, exactly. But anyway, so that's using facts, using statistics, using science. Sorry, sister? Concerning the same topic? Yeah, okay. sister. And that's why we have uh, another system here, another rule, so which uh, basically I say 1 plus 1 equals 2. That's the rule. 1 plus 1 equals 2. That's how people learn anything. When you start learning math, you learn 1 plus 1 equals 2. That's the first mathematical equation, right? Then you can go to c squared equals a squared plus b squared. No one ever starts their child like that. No. You always start like this. And so that's why, as the sister was saying, you can refer everything back to Allah as the When I understand my relationship with Allah, the rights of Allah upon me, then I can understand all the big and small things as well. Because one time, um, someone born Muslim came to me. He said, and this someone born as a Muslim, but obviously, you know, nothing to do with this now in practice. So he comes to me, he said, look, I want to know why does Allah care if, if I eat ham or not? And if I pick you know, ham from the menu, why does Allah care? Shouldn't He just care if I kill someone, if I murder, if I steal? See? With no knowledge, you can see why He's thinking of it like that. Why does Allah care if I go to the menu and I say, give me a number four? It was such a simple process. Instead of number three, give me a number four. I get it, I eat it, then I'll be honest for the rest of the day, I won't murder or kill anybody. So why does Allah care about these things? So then, you one plus one equals two. He can't get it because there's some things they don't know here. So then you start to explain to him, yes, picking number four is a simple process. All you have to say is give me a number four, you pay, you pay two ninety nine. that's it. But it comes under disobeying Allah Azza wa and that's the big deal. That's why the early Muslims used to say, yeah, do not look at how small the sin is, but look at the greatness of the one you're sinning against. Yeah? That's the big deal. So if Allah Azza wa and, and so you're to obey Allah Azza the Muslim is the one who submits to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when you submit, Allah says, go right, you go right. He says, go left, you go left. Do this, you do it. Don't do it, you stay away from it. That's the bigger picture. Because it falls under this greater umbrella. Not the fact that it's such an easy physical process. And we give analogies now, which is another double technique. You give analogies and it helps explain. So we're doing 1 plus 1 equals 2 and we're looking at analogies as well. So you tell them, look, if... Uh, and if now, let's say you're, you're at work and the boss doesn't want you to answer the phone. He says, okay, don't answer that phone. And the phone rings and you, you look him in the eye and you pick up the phone. Now, what's the big deal? I mean, it was a very, it's not like I went from here to Taiwan or something. It's just, I picked up one part of my body moved, you know, less than two feet. And I said, hello, what's the big deal? You can argue, mechanically, it was a simple process. But you disobeyed your boss. We don't like him a lot to his creation. But it fell into a larger umbrella. That's why you got in trouble, even though if the action was so simple. Or if you're going to use the, the chauffeur, the big shots on the back of the limo, and he tells him, Jeeves make a right, Jeeves makes a left. He can make a very simple argument. Instead of mechanically turning this way, I turned mechanically, but it was just the other way. What's the big deal? The big deal, Yaqi, is you disobeyed your boss. Or maybe Jeeves just kept driving. He would get fired. Not because of mechanically it's simple or it didn't take too long that's not what it's about it's about disobeying Allah Azza that's why again and again we come back to it your talk is about Allah your talk is about Tawheed your talk is about submitting to Allah Azza then people can understand when Allah says you know do not come near zina or don't come near alcohol or you know don't eat pork or 
don't do this or don't do that or don't be gay. All these things, now they make sense. So that's why it's so important for you to explain to people that 1 plus 1 equals 2 first before you move on to algebra and more complicated things. Anytime you get stuck, someone's asking you, well, what about it and why not? And why this and why that? Tell me, actually, wait. It's Allah Azza wa who says, do it or don't do it. And your job is to, is to do it. And of course, part of the mercy of Allah, He still lets us understand why we're doing and the wisdom behind why we're to do something or not to do something. So, you, we discussed then, using facts, statistics, or science, uh, we discussed then, you can explain so many things through explaining first that it's you submitting to Allah Azza wa Or that if you're the Muslim, Allah tells you to do something, you have to do it. Sometimes someone will come and say, you know, I, I believe, yeah, I believe, yeah, that uh, I, I'm ready to become Muslim, but I don't want to pray five times a day. I'll keep drinking alcohol. I'll keep seeing my girlfriend or what have you. And I'll drink, you know, eat pork whenever. But I'll just do the other things. You see what the problem is here? The problem is this person doesn't want to submit. Or he wants to make up his own rule. Or he wants to be his own ilah, make up. So, and, and we've done this to people in the street. They say, look, I'll do this, and I'll do that, and I'll do that. I say, listen, you, know, you want to do it your way. And that's not what a Muslim is. The Muslim is the one who submits to what Allah says. When Allah says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhaladheena amanu, idkhulu fi silmi kafa. Enter into totality into Islam. 100%. Not 98 even. Not even 99. 100%. So you tell them, look, you know, who is the God here? And who's the follower? And you want to accept Islam on your own terms. And you want to obey Allah on your own terms. And Wallahi, they look down immediately out of shame. So, 1 plus 1 equals 2. It makes your life so much easier. Explain to them, it's about Allah Azza wa Submitting to Allah Azza wa The disobedience, the sin, don't look at it as in the worldly life. Like, well, sin, I just moved from here to there. Or I just ordered this and I said this simple phrase. No. It's about you disobeying Allah and His greatness. So, 1 plus 1 equals 2. Uh, okay, now, uh, we said, uh, while we were talking, we said uh, analogies, right? Oh, let me do one more. Sometimes, also, okay, let me, someone tells you, I'll become Muslim, or no, he says, I can't become Muslim because I love pork too much. You have no clue how many times we've heard this argument. Someone is ready, the five pillars, everything, we got there, we go for the gold, no, why not? I love pork chops too much. This guy told me I love pork chops too much. Another guy told me I could never become Muslim. Why? I like a cold beer after dinner. Now, how would you, there's no wrong way, how would you refute? Someone tells you I like pork chops too much. Huh? The, the part of the chicken is called the ham. Wait, yes, okay. Part of the chicken is called the ham? Yeah, for a part of the cows. So you're telling them eat uh, like imitation ham, ham. Huh? Okay. Is there anything like imitation pork chops? Think so. All right. Yeah. All right. So Sadman's getting hardcore here. Saying he's talking about the pain of hell. Excellent. Become Muslim. Should us? Just become Muslim and oh. make you want to allow to change you. Okay. Zakir Khair and that. If I can critique that a little bit, the it's you're right, that's your last resort. You just don't give up that quickly. But that is your right, last resort. Okay, anything else? You're all right, by the way. It, it's not that I'm looking for something specific. Remember what we said? There are many ways you can refute one argument, many ways you can convince a person. Why don't you come over to my place, inshallah, I'll make some that jobs for you, mate. <laughs> the brother's taking the cooking competition, yeah? Okay, so you're going to iron chef him out of pork chops, right? <laughs> okay. Tell him, hey, have you ever tried biryani? <laughs> yeah? Become Muslim sometimes slowly go off it late. Okay, you're right. Just, just, there's a few things before that. Just That's the last resort. Maybe you're done um, the idea of... Sorry, sorry, sisters, can you hear? No. Oh, man, I'm so sorry. Always feel free to put your hands up and tell me if I don't look at you. You can throw something in this direction. <laughs> no. I apologize. I'll start repeating what they're saying. I'm very sorry. Maybe, maybe you can uh, re, uh, remind him the purpose of uh, being a Muslim. You're submitting, and if okay. you're not doing that, you're not, you're not really submitting. Okay, good. So the brother is saying you can remind him the purpose of, of why you're a Muslim, submitting, and if you're not doing that, you're not really submitting. 
other other brothers said, you know, we'll tell them you can do it. Uh, for now, you become Muslim now, and just uh, you know, slowly, slowly make du'a. Maybe you can stop the pork chops. Uh, what, what other arguments did we have? I want to repeat them for the sister. Uh, the brother said, you know, I'll have alternatives, and I'll cook some lamb chops for you. Forget pork chops. Uh, what else, uh, sister? Two brothers said that, and the only thing I said is that that's true. That when you khalas, you cannot uh, convince them anymore. Then you say that. But let's just try a little bit more. Yes, sister. Uh huh. And then if they say uh, we'll stop, <coughs> then, then what? Ah, yeah. like uh -huh. see how the sister did. Yeah. No? She said to yourself, what if you get a disease that the pork will make you sick if you eat it? So then the guy will say, I'll stop eating pork. So then she says, you can't stop then. You understand? You have the ability to stop. It's just a, it's a matter now of the will. He has the ability. Yes, sir? You, you had something earlier? No, I was saying, how long does the pleasure last? Uh-huh. How long does the pleasure last? Okay, it lasts about an hour and a half, but I repeat it tomorrow. <laughs> but Zatul Khair, good, you're right, you're right. Uh, last one. Yes, sir. Talk about the uh, harms of the pork or, or alcohol. Uh huh, okay. Talk about how harmful they are. To okay, good. But Jamil did that. All right, thank you. Very good. Zatul Khair, everybody. Now let me just add, and these techniques are all excellent. I'm going to add one more. Okay. Again, I'm not saying this is a detail, it's just one more style or, or way uh, that we used to use a lot. Because it just, it's easy and it worked very well. We shame them out of it. We shame them out of it. So just about a huge percentage of those who said, look, I would actually become Muslim right now, it's just I love pork too much. A huge percentage of them became Muslim right after we said this. We shame them out of it. We say, look, so you know, and I'm trying to tell you exactly what we tell them, man. Someone says, you know, I love pork chops too much. So, okay. So you're telling me that with all the, the good that Allah has done for you in this world, with all the blessings that He has given you, and He's, yeah, and he's given you your eyesight, can you put a price on that? They'll say, no. You know, your intelligence, your family, your loved ones, your health, no. So then all the good things that Allah has done for you, and He's provided for you, and pushed away harm from you, on top of that, He has provided for you so many blessings, so many different kinds of of food from the sea that you can eat, so many different kinds of plants and vegetables, so many different flavors of spices, the different kinds of meat that you can eat, from cows, from sheep, to camels, to what have you, to chicken, to ostriches, to emus, and so many kinds of things that you can eat. And, there, and the human body, and the human being can go on with no food for up to 40, from anywhere from 30 to 40 days with nothing to eat whatsoever, up to three days with nothing to drink whatsoever. And you're telling me, with all the things and the blessings and the things that Allah has made possible and available, alternatives for you on earth, you're not willing to give up one kind of meat after Allah commanded you and all the good He's been doing for you? Wallahi, they just look at the ground and say, yeah, of course I can, of course I was just playing around. Go ahead. <laughs> and they say the shahad. So, I'm not saying it will work every time, remember, we're saying, but it has worked for us tremendously. Akhi, what's your problem? You're telling me pork? Allah has done all this for you and He's still going to keep doing it for you. And you're telling me pork? And there's so much other things to eat and sometimes you know people get stuck in the jungle and they live off of uh, worms and maggots and I don't know what. And you tell me you have to eat pork? You don't have to eat it. You don't have to have the cold beer after, after dinner. So excellent. Every technique that was used here was great. They all work on an equal level. And whatever one you like, you use that. And it's not like we always just use the shame them out of it technique. Sometimes we we'll use the other technique. You're always trying different things, and sometimes the shame me out of it won't work on this guy. There's no shame. You try some other thing. Now, while we're on the topic, I want to quickly talk about, uh, and when is our break coming up? Mm -hmm. Okay. In just a little bit, maybe we'll take a quick break. Um, yeah, while we're on the topic of pork, uh, why is pork? Uh, what's, what's the reason that we can't eat pork? What's the reason we can't eat pork, young man? It affects your health. Uh, meat is 
No? It's not good for you? It's not good for you? Um, there's a Uh huh. All the hands went down. Great. <laughs> That's the reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us not to. That's the reason. That's the reason for it. It's haram. Allah made it haram. That's the reason. Now, the other things are wisdoms behind why it's haram. The health, all the other stuff, these are wisdoms behind why it's haram. Because if the reason you don't eat pork, look, this is the reason why it's haram. Because it's bad for you. It's dirty. Right? That means if I get a pig, and I name the pig Wilbur, and Wilbur eats just cookies and ice cream. And he's always washed every 10 minutes we bathe Wilbur. And then we slaughter him. Can we eat Wilbur? No. We said the reason was the dirt, so this was a clean one. That means we can eat it. So that means the reason isn't because they're, they're dirty or something. The reason is that Allah has made it haram. Some of the wisdoms are, yes, the trichinosis, the fat content, and all the other stuff, and that it's a filthy animal, it's a and that... No? It's a carnivore. It's a carnivore, and it's also promiscuous. Huh? And uh, by the way, that's one of the main wisdoms the scholars used to, the early scholars used to mention. Why, you know, pork is haram. They say it's a promiscuous animal. And they used to argue that you are what you eat. And I know you might think, well, that was a long time ago. It's not scientific. It's actually very scientific. There's a Muslim doctor, he's like a, he has a PhD in food science. And he can sum up 23 years of work in the field in one sentence. He said, it's just like computers. Garbage in, garbage out. He says, you are what you eat. You are what you eat. And it's very, very true. You are what you eat. And so, some scholars used to argue that the, the pig is a very promiscuous animal. I mean, it's just nasty the way it's promiscuous. And uh, they said that if you eat it, that trait would come over to you. And... Who can argue? I mean, you see in countries where people eat pork, very promiscuous, yeah. so there's some truth to that. So anyways, um, so there's a difference. That's why if someone tells you, you know, it's the reason you wear your hijab, you say, okay, well, it's because, you know, the woman should be protected. So what if you're in a village where all the men are chained up? You can take off your hijab, man. They're chained up in the street, they can see you. But you're protected from them because they're chained up. You take off your hijab? No. The reason is Allah commanded you. Some of the wisdoms, you know, protected so the woman doesn't become an object, so people do yeah, yeah, you kid all the other things. Anyways. But like I said, you know, all the arguments have been uh, it's all been done. But uh, the so then you can shame people out of an argument and give them facts and statistics about it. You can link it back to their submission to their obedience. So Allah Azza wa Jal, you can use analogies or give comparisons to the dunya. We can give us some examples where you give an analogy or a comparison to something in the dunya. Yes, sir. I was just wondering, when we say things like, can we phrase things in a humble way or should it be direct? Like, should we say, we believe Allah commanded us versus Allah commanded us? Uh-huh. I like that. That's a very good question. Not that there's necessarily a right or a wrong answer, but I'm just going to see it as for a show of hands. Who would rather say, we believe that Allah commanded us, or we believe the Prophet said that? Who, who thinks we should say, we believe? Put your hands up. Okay, so about four, five people, uh, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, go right here, twelve. Here are twelve, here are twelve, here are twelve. All right, now, who thinks you say, no, Allah says we should do this? Prophet Good. Okay. So, uh, and are you guys just the ones who are right, or are you can go both ways? It could possibly go both ways. I'm going to argue that the second way is stronger. It's <laughs> the second way is stronger. It, it's not, you know. But again, I'm not necessarily right here. This is just what I feel. Feel isn't science. So, uh, it, it's, sometimes the way we present Islam is like we're just sharing our faith with you. And I, when, look, it depends on what it is. Yani if, it's, uh, if it's a straight da'wah, you're trying to give them da'wah, then I would use it the more direct one. If, if, let's say, it's just some kind of class and they just give you two minutes to say something and 
you would hear, you might say, well, they're talking about Muslims. You might say, we believe this, this as Muslims. But if I'm giving someone da'wah, I want him to feel this, not, this is not just me sharing what we, those people, believe. I want to let him know that this is what's oblig obligatory upon you as well. So Allah commanded humanity to do this. Allah commanded mankind to follow the Prophet ﷺ. And, and uh, you know, not that we believe and that you, we should or you should do this, this and that. So for the purposes of da'wah, it's good to let them, to, be, to have them included in the statement. You know, because they're also obligated to follow. You know the subhanAllah, the ulama say that yani the kafir will be, for, you know, the longer they live, it's worth, worse for them. Every day they didn't pray, they're going to be asked about. Every day they didn't pray. Every Ramadan that they didn't fast, they'll be asked about. So, so they're at, it's actually upon them the obligation. So you want to make them feel that they're obligated as well. This is when you're giving them direct da'wah. You make it like, you know, this is for you and for me. No. Would you also say that because you say, I, I believe that, if, I, if you say, Allah commanded me to do this, then you're firm with your belief. There's no hesitation or... That's fine, yeah. That's fine, absolutely. And that's why I said, you know, you could use either one. But I'm just trying to add another element of including that person in this commandment or in the obligation. Make them feel obligated as well. But, so with the analogy, with the, using the dunya as a comparison or analogy, how would you do that? I've got some examples. Anyone have examples here? So, okay, here we go. So, for example, number three, okay, and like for example, the guy who who, who said, I, uh, we're talking about Trinity, right? So, we're talking about Trinity, and this guy says that uh, I asked him, I'm trying to make it very clear. To him. So, okay, so now you have, you're saying that there are three gods, but they're one, yeah? Even though they're physically separate, he said, yeah. So I said, one plus one plus one equals, he said, one. So said, okay, now one of them died for three days. Now during this period, one plus one equals, and he swallowed, and he said, one. Because it's embarrassing for him. So now I want to, yeah, he rubbed his nose in it a little bit. So I said, okay, so let me see if I understand this correctly. One plus one plus one equals one. And then one plus one also equals one. He said yes. <laughs> so then he got the stroke of genius. Put his head up and said, and one times one times one equals one. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I was so shocked when I first said this. I said, why are we multiplying? He said, well, that's another way in which the equation should equal one. <laughs> so now, this, obviously, there's no logic whatsoever here. It doesn't make any sense. So one of the ways to get people to see things logically the point that we're on right now, make comparisons to the dunya, which is really an analogy, right? You're, you're making a comparison, an analogy, but you're using the dunya, because with the dunya, people can become very, very logical, but then when it comes to the deen, they lose that logic again. So here, I said, okay, now if I put three bottles of water on the table, how will you, how will you give me the sum there? Are you going to say one times one times one equals one bottle of water, because if that's the way you think, I want to borrow three hundred dollars from you, and I'll give you one. Back. And you can multiply it until it gets fifty times. I don't care. So the reality is, when you give comparisons to the dunya, suddenly people become logical. So tell them, okay, three bottles of water on the table, and if I take one away, you have two. So don't tell me, you know, one times one times one. Now we bring them back to logic. For example, someone says, I don't believe in organized religion. You know. Uh, or, you know, let me do this one for... Uh, but, but, yeah, someone tells you, yeah, that there are as many ways to God as there are souls on earth. That's uh, okay. What if I told you there are as many ways to your house as you can imagine? Any way you want to get to your house. You want to drive through a one-way street, go ahead, across the lake, go ahead, people's front yard. Just drive. Just Your home is that way? Just hit the gas and go in that direction. You won't accept that. Because everything has to be organized. And even events... Whatever it is you do, if it's disorganized, you don't like it. So why is it that you want your way to God to be any way that you want? You know, this guy will do it through that, this will do it through, through doing this act of worship, and they'll invent things, and it'll get you there. So you give him comparisons to the dunya. And that's like number three there, evil, so the evil and the jar of darkness. 
Like sometimes someone will ask you, and let's do this, and you can answer using any technique you like. Someone asks you, why, uh, why do, why does Allah allow evil on earth? Or why does, why do good things, or why do bad things happen to good people? If someone's good, why does that? What does a bad thing happen to a good person? So now you can. How many ways do you want to answer? Yes. Sir. Allah has various ways of testing a believer, and just because he's doing you, uh, you believe doing you favors in the, in the dunya doesn't mean that he's pleased with you. It's just a way, a way of testing you. Okay, good. So now let's do this, just so we are very clear on this point. We're having one question. Why do? If, if so, so if you taking notes, write down. Why do? bad things happen to good people? That's the question. And then I want you to list all the different ways and techniques that you can respond to this question. Just so you can get an idea of how it's one question, but I can apply any one of these methods to answer it. So the first, so why do bad things happen to good people? Number one, our brother said that Allah is testing people. So it's a test, it's part of the test. It's a test for those people and it's a test also for other people. Will they react? Will they assist? Will they help? And will they, you know, become unified? All of that. So that's another way to answer it. Yes, sir. Okay, so then you link it to the Akhirah. So it will make their, it will elevate their rank in the Akhirah. It will expiate from their sins in this dunya and, you know, move them forward in the Akhirah. So that's another way of explaining it. Yes, sir. This is bad according to you. But it doesn't have to be bad according to Allah or according to... Uh -huh. So now you're using, you're looking at the, the infinite wisdom of Allah Azza wa Jal. Something happens to you now and it seems like a bad thing. And years later you see that it's a good thing. I'm sure everyone in this room can think of something like that. It, it was bad at that time, but later on it was good. Yes, sir. That was for, three. For life to be fair, you should have uh, the same number of years of misery as you do of happiness. Okay. It's a bit too much. We don't want the same, yeah? But okay, so then, so you're talking about how it makes every, it makes life fair, it makes life balanced. That if you know, like the argument, if you didn't experience the bad, you wouldn't really enjoy the good as much. So you can use that. That's number four. Yes, sir. What if nothing bad happened to anybody? Everything was perfect. Oh, I like you. He's saying, what if, uh, what if nothing bad happened to anybody? So now he's responding by asking and getting them to think about the question. That's another technique now. Very good. Or it's similar to. The, another technique that we're going to come to, and I'm just going to mention here, uh, the, using the flip side of the argument. The flip side of the argument. Flip the argument around. Yes, sir? Uh, in uh, life, if, if you want to get a career, you have to go through school, you have to go through training, you have to go through these hardships and tests. Mm -hmm. So if you are uh, trying to get into heaven, don't you think you have to go through the, the same training Excellent. and tests? Excellent. Right. Uh, oh, sorry, sisters, can you hear? So sorry, So he said, you know, in life, and brothers, let's do this also. Raise your voices a little, okay? Or a lot, okay? Try to remember that, so the sisters can hear also. So he's saying that in life, you know, if whatever you want, you have to go through tests and training, and you want a degree, you go through the difficulty. So what, and what technique is he using? Analogies, making comparison to the dunya. Excellent. Uh, someone else had their hand up over here. Yes, uh, Salman. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, maybe it's a punishment. Okay, possibly a punishment, yeah. Why can't we just compare our difficulties with the difficulties of the pious people before us? Uh huh, okay, so, alright, so you're saying you know, the worst could have happened. Sister in the back? Uh, you can say that what is your, um, what do you mean by good people? Maybe the things that they're doing in their life is causing Uh huh, and so it's now getting into the details a little bit. Let's define good people. Let's define good people, yes? Excellent. You understand that? Sister saying, who said the dunya is a, is, should, has to be the land of happiness? The land of happiness is there. Okay, sorry, I'm going to ask someone to give us the flip side of the argument. Use that technique now. The flip side of the argument. There are many ways you can flip this argument around. Flip it back on them. You get something to think. When you flip it, you get people to think about their, their, their question again. Flip it. You can say, why do you, like, uh -huh. why do you, um, just reverse the words. Yeah. Good, good. Why do bad things happen to you guys? 
Why are you passing down the you guys? Who are you guys? No. The question was why do bad things happen to good people? So the reverse would be why do why do good things happen to bad people? Everyone understand that? That's the flip side. Keep flipping it. We're still on flipping it. Only. Only flipping it. Why do bad You don't have to flip the wording, but you flip the idea also. To bad people. Exactly. Why wouldn't bad things happen to good people? Okay. So why wouldn't? Yeah. So he's saying why not? All right. Yeah? They ask why is there evil? They ask them why is there good? What they just like it doesn't make good. Okay. So now it's uh, let's define we're defining words again, Omar? How can it differentiate between what is uh what is um bad Okay. It, it's like it's kind of like the earlier argument. It, it might be bad now, but it's actually on the long term very good for you. All right, I'll add one more to that. One of the ways we... Okay, sister? Well, can I ask an example? Do you follow every minute how, you, how many minutes your heart beats? And what happens if you said no and then you attention to So you're trying to say that... And we don't follow the lessons we have. Ah, excellent. Because you are Okay. Taib, now let me let me ask you this. Sorry, uh, there's there's uh, there's one more thing, and if, again flipping the argument around, and you want them to think about their question because, I mean, I, I don't accept that kind of question. Why do bad things happen to good people? So I usually when someone asks me that question, and I'm not saying again, and I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm doing here. I just want to share a technique with you. I'm not saying that okay, you guys are done. Let me show you how you do it. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying, right? I'm just sharing a technique with you. I let you speak, and then I'm, I'm not saying this is the cherry on top. Now pay attention. So what I'm trying to say is, when someone asks me that question, I usually say, and this is just because it's easier for me, I usually ask them, how much intervention do you want? How much intervention do you want in this world? You don't want their argument. They don't want bad things to happen to good people. So then I tell them about a good man. He's up on his... Uh, his son, you know, it's a Sunday, his family, children are playing in the garden, and he's working on the, on the ceiling, on the roof, you know, shingles or whatever. And then he's up on this high ladder, the ladder starts to slowly tip, and he's going to smash onto the hard concrete floor in front of his family. And he's a good person, by your definition, whatever definition it is, good person, whatever. He's going to fall. How much intervention do you want? You don't want bad things to happen to good people. So what do you want to happen now? Suddenly a big king-size mattress shows up underneath the gut. And posturpedic even, not just any mattress. You know? Sleep number bed, on the softest number. You know? So how much intervention do you want? A good person is walking down the aisle in the grocery store, he slips on the water, he's about to smash and break his bones on the hard floor, suddenly there's a big feather pillow underneath him. Or there's a mudslide in one of the villages. You know, and all the, the children shouldn't be injured because they're good, the little kids. And so, their parents, 100,000 of them, die in the mudslide. But all the children, when the rescuers come, they're like, you know, 200,000 children sitting with the mud and just staring wide-eyed, and they're sitting there because nothing bad happened to them. Just their parents died, and now we need to find homes for all of them, and so on and so forth. So how much intervention do you want? And, and there's also, by the way, about the evil on Earth, there is also another analogy now with the... And with, with how Allah Azza wa Jal created, you know, created human beings and He gave them free will. So that's not an analogy. There's the free will thing. So sometimes people choose to do bad things to other people and then it becomes a bad thing. But they have been given free will by Allah. That's one thing. Another thing is that also that Allah Azza wa Jal commanded us and He taught us how, how the good comes. But when we choose to leave the guidance of Allah, evil occurs. And that's the analogy with the jar. You know? So like right now, this transparent bottle here, and in a room that's lit like this, if I give it to you, while the room is still lit, can you give it back to me with darkness inside it? No. No. Why not? Because darkness is the absence of light. Dark al-khair, brother. Ziyad said, darkness is the absence of light. The darkness doesn't occur in and of it by itself. It only occurs as a result of the lack of something else. When there's no light, we get darkness. So someone will tell me, if God is good, why did He create evil? I tell him, listen, Allah Azza wa Jal, he, he created good, and He showed us the way to good, but when we choose to not follow the light of Allah, 
we, or the guidance of Allah, we get evil. And that's why there's one time someone said, you know, I don't understand. And I said, look, if I give you a jar, can you give it back to me full of dark or darkness? He said, no. So I said, so he, actually, he didn't say no. He said, I understand. He immediately got it. So when people don't follow the light of Allah, and they murder, and they steal, and they lie, evil occurs in the world. Allah didn't force the evil on, on people or make them do evil. And so, again, it's just an analogy, it's a way of, of clearing the... So a lot of times when people, and again, I'm not saying it's the best way, but sometimes when people ask me, you know, well, why is there so much evil on earth if God is good and so on, and He wants good for us? But look, I mean, Allah gave us free will, He taught us the right way, and then I tell them it's like the jar. And if you don't want to use the jar, you can use cold. You know, cold doesn't really exist. You know, I'm sure you as Canadians know this thing. Cold doesn't exist by itself. It only happens when something else is not there, which is heat or energy. When there's no heat and there's no energy, you get cold. And that's why there's something called absolute zero, right? Physics people, any physics people here? Yeah? Scientists, yeah. Absolute zero is how many degrees? Celsius? Minus 273.16. Excuse me? 273.16. 273.16. Well, okay, good. But, so that's absolute zero because you can't get colder than that. Why not? Because that's a, pla that's a time when there is zero energy, zero heat. So, heat, cold only occurs when there's no heat. So, you can use these analogies to explain things to people. So, uh, and that's why, you know, and, but. Get to think about any way that we mentioned. I don't know how many we mentioned, like six, seven, eight ways of answering that question. So pick the one that you like, or pick the one that's for you that's the easiest and fastest, or get the point across. I've, oh, really? You tell me, stop? Okay, but I think it's probably time. So what time is it? Oh, wow. We went clear to lunch, right? Lunch is 12 30 or 1? Okay, so we take a 10 minute break and then do 50 minutes to lunch? Alright, so we'll take a 10 minute break, inshallah, from the Mubarak and Muhammad,